Welcome to our discussion on the types of third parties. Third parties have existed in the United States since the early 19th century. Over the nation's history, third parties typically have fallen into one of three general categories. Issue advocacy parties, ideologically oriented parties, and splinter parties. Issue advocacy parties were formed to promote a stance on a particular issue. Many issue advocacy parties are short-lived. Once the issue is dealt with or fades from popular concern, the mobilizing force behind the party disintegrates. An example is today's Green Party, which promotes environmental protection as a primary issue and also emphasizes human rights, childhood poverty, globalization, health care, and corporate corruption and greed in its party platform. In the 2000 presidential election, the Green Party sought to win 5% of the vote for its presidential candidate, Ralph Nader. If the Greens had succeeded, they would have automatically qualified their party for federal matching funds in the 2004 campaign. The Green Party fell short, however, since it captured only 3% of the vote. Its share of the vote then dropped sharply in the 2004 presidential election. Ideologically oriented parties. The agenda of an ideologically oriented party is typically broader than that of an issue oriented party. Ideologically oriented parties are structured around an ideology, a highly organized and coherent framework concerning the nature and role of government in society. Such parties have broad views about many different aspects of government. For example, the Libertarian Party, which holds the ideological position that government should not interfere with individuals' social, political, and economic rights, advocates a very limited role for government. No guarantees of minimum wages or other forms of government regulation of the economy, including environmental regulation. No governmental interference in individuals' privacy, the legalization of prostitution and drugs, and the elimination of major governmental bureaucracies, including the Central Intelligence Agency, the Internal Revenue Service, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Another ideologically oriented party is the Socialist Party, which lies at the other end of the ideological spectrum from the Libertarian Party. The Socialist Party, formed in 1901, is one of the longest standing ideologically oriented parties in the United States. Socialists believe that government should play a large role in ensuring economic equality for all people. Splinter parties. A splinter party is a political party that breaks off or splinters from one of the two dominant parties. Often a group splinters off because of intra-party, internal or within the party, disagreement on a particular issue. Though many Tea Party candidates sought election under the Republican Party label in 2010, the sometimes fractured relationship between the activists and more moderate Republicans caused many to wonder if the Tea Party will splinter from the Republican Party. In 1948, a group of Southern Democrats who opposed the Democratic Party Support of civil rights for African Americans splintered from the Democratic Party to form the state's rights party, which quickly became known as the Dixiecrat Party. The party called itself the state's rights party because it claimed that Congress had no power to interfere with the administration of laws made by the states. It used that claim to retain the policies that created a system of racial segregation in the South. Although the state's rights party was a separate, formal organization, many Southern Democratic elected officials and party leaders who agreed with the state's rights party platform supported its views from within the Democratic Party. Despite the difficulties associated with sustaining support in American electoral politics, third parties have important effects in the political arena. First, although U.S. third parties usually do not win elections, they can influence electoral outcomes. For example, given the closeness of the 2000 presidential race, many Democrats believe that Green Party candidate Ralph Nader caused Democratic Al Gore to lose the election. They reason that Nader votes would have been more likely to vote for the liberal Gore than for the conservative George W. Bush if Nader had not been a candidate. In a state such as Florida, where the electoral was evenly divided, Nader's candidacy, in fact, could have changed the outcome of that state's balloting and thus the results of the national election as well. Of course, many third-party advocates claim that supporters of a third-party candidate may not have voted at all if their party had not been on the ballot. Second, third parties provide a release valve for dissatisfied voters. People who are disgruntled with the two major parties can join or form another political party. And although a third party's chances of electoral success are not great, such parties provide a mechanism for like-minded people to come together to try to effect change. Sometimes, these efforts result in a victory, especially on the local level. A well-known third-party victor is Jesse Ventura, a former professional wrestler, wrestler who was elected governor of Minnesota in 1998 as a candidate of the Reform Party. At the national level, there have been several elections in which third parties were a release valve for disconnected voters, as shown in this graph. 
In U.S. history, third-party presidential candidates have won more than 10 percent of the vote seven times, the latest being in 1992 when independent party candidate H. Ross Perot captured 19 percent of the vote. As the figure illustrates, in five of those seven candidates cases, excuse me, the incumbent party's presidential nominee lost the presidency. Thus, third parties tend to help the major out-of-party, out-of-power party win election. Finally, third parties put a variety of issues on the national political agenda. When a third party, especially an issue-oriented third party, draws attention to an issue of concern. Sometimes government officials respond to that concern even if the third party fails in its election bid. In some such cases, the issue has not previously been given priority and the attention the third party draws to it serves to create a groundswell of political pressure that forces action. In other cases, the policymakers might act to address the issue in order to woo the supporters of the third party who have expressed that particular issue concern. Historically, the two major parties' co-option of issues that were first prompted, excuse me, first promoted by third parties has sometimes contributed to the demise of third parties. For example, as we have seen, the progressive's presidential candidate Theodore Roosevelt lost to Democrat Woodrow Wilson in 1912, but Wilson enacted many elements of the progressive party's platform, including antitrust regulations, corporate law reforms, and banking regulations. Lacking a unique platform and with comparatively little electoral success, the progressives faded away. More recently, Reform Party candidate H. Ross Perot's activism concerning campaign finance reform eventually led the two major parties to pass the Bipartisan Campaign Finance Reform Act of 2002, otherwise known as the McCain-Feingold Act. The Reform Party's inability to sustain voter support over the long haul is also apparent. After the party's 2000 presidential nominee, Pat Buchanan, failed to net even 1% of the national vote, the party did not nominate a candidate in 2004, instead backing Green Party nominee Ralph Nader.